Thank you, sir. Um, first, I want to thank um, Neeta and Sanjay and Archana and uh, uh, everyone who is involved with IDEC, and particularly Neeta, who has been a super dear friend for many years, and, and I know what she has done for me. So thank you so much, Neeta, for this kind invitation. And also, um, you know, agreeing to move me from Sunday to today and, uh, and agreeing for this topic, which is very important, I feel, because uh, gestational diabetes, unlike all other things in diabetes we are talking about, which, you know, seem not to have this kind of um, movement all the time. We are not able to catch it, not just the numbers. We are not able to come to the same page on how to diagnose it, how to define it, what to do with it, how to follow up the patients. Everything seems to be a moving target, and that's why I chose that particular title. So quickly, I'll show you how, you know, I'm calling it the rise and rise of GDM, and definition and risk factors and pathogenesis and screening and diagnosis, and a little bit about uh, management, which actually seems um, a little bit simpler than all the other things in, in, in GDM. So the IDF Atlas 7 um, shows you how about nearly 25% of all births are affected by high blood glucose in Southeast Asia. This is a very big number. And just to give you an idea, the number of births per year in India alone is somewhere around 25 million, 24, 25 million, which is more than the population of Sri Lanka. So uh, the average births, and this is, you know, uh, samples from Taiwan and New Zealand and, and the U.S. and other places where everywhere it uh, seems to be on the rise. And look at this particular slide. I've just circled India. And even though it doesn't look as high as the others, simply given the number of people we have, every 1% you know, increase makes it a big increase. And this also highlights how we are using four different criteria for making the diagnosis. And that, again, probably underscores the real numbers that we are having, or underplays the real numbers that we are having. As far as definition, why, again, we are not on the same page, it used to be called onset or first recognition of abnormal glucose tolerance during pregnancy. Any degree of glucose intolerance during pregnancy was called GDM. And then the uh, WHO came out and said sometime in um, you know, 2010, they published it in 2013, they said gestational diabetes is a distinct entity that is diagnosed in the second half of the pregnancy and should be distinguished from probable pre-existing diabetes and glucose intolerance, which kind of said that whatever we are picking up in early pregnancy is not the true blue GDM, but you know, something that was already there, and people marched into the pregnancy with that. And, and this big study from the south of India, published by Dr. Seshaya, uh, and they showed that among the GDM women, 71% were actually detected at the first visit. So what it really means is a large number of women are walking into the pregnancy these days with prediabetes or diabetes or metabolic syndrome or some degree of glucose intolerance. To make things, this whole moving target, a little bit more interesting, in the most recent 2021 or 2020 Banting lecture, David Simmons said we should have a new classification where we should call it as, um, you know, uh, incident GDM, and you know, meaning the GDM that happens after 24 weeks or so um, is called as incident GDM, and anything that happened before that as prevalent GDM. And, and that is a, a new definition that he is recommending. So I think we should just be aware that it's not happening just between 24 and 28 weeks, that throughout pregnancy, women are having abnormal glucose levels. And the traditional risk factors were maternal overweight, obesity, large, uh, later age at childbearing, previous history of GDM, family history of type 2 diabetes, ethnicity. They were the major GDM factors. 
But if you look at this one, you can see um, things like PCOS, uh, hypertension, uh, metabolic syndrome, all of those. And of course, you know, uh, obesity has been mentioned. These have all become very, very important risk factors for uh, gestational diabetes. One of the other things that I want to point out is maternal low birth weight increases the risk of GDM in the mother. And if she gives birth to a low birth weight, that baby is at, and it's a girl, that baby is at risk for future GDM and diabetes. So these are all additional risk factors. And we are all now talking about social determinants of health. And I want to point out in this study, this is from our own NFHS, National Family Health Survey, that was looked at. And they showed if they came from a member of a scheduled tribe, there was an increased risk. So as you keep increasing the, adding the risk factors, their risk for gestational diabetes just went up. The odds ratio went up exponentially. Maybe these are all the reasons why we are not able to, you know, catch the whole uh, problem and, and come up with a, a, a good solution. And in terms of um, pathogenesis, you can see um, pre-pregnancy, the ethnicity, physical activity, sorry, I don't know what I did. Um, Pre-pregnancy, ethnicity, physical activity, obesity, dietary composition, all of those, um, you know, make a polycystic ovary syndrome, all of those make a, are all um, uh, predisposing factors. And on top of that, if they have, you know, other factors, placental factors like um, placental lactogen, placental growth hormone, estrogen, progesterone, cortisone, all of those things, they're all um, diabetogenic hormones. And pregnancy itself is a, a diabetogenic event. So this is really the, the crux of the pathophysiology. Um, just to show you that the, comparing NFHS 4 and 5, absolutely new data showing that women, whether they are girl, children, um, everywhere women seem to be having uh, a, a lot more um, uh, obesity and which is a major risk factor. In this excellent study from um, Mohan and Nikhil Tandon and others showed the amount of pre-diabetes in girls of reproductive age, somewhere around 35, 40%. And now you see why they are walking into the pregnancy and having abnormal glucose, the CARS data. And this is post-pregnancy weight gain, which means they gain some weight in the first pregnancy that stays on and so in the next pregnancy, which is the low-hanging fruit, they are again at greater risk for recurrence of GDM or even just GDM in the second pregnancy. So these are all the drivers of gestational diabetes and add to that the new microbiome theory as well to GDM. So why do we worry about GDM so much? Because major consequences on mother and baby during pregnancy, increased risk of preeclampsia in the mother, and then for the baby, of course, if it is early on, they could have birth defects, and then other things like fetal programming and large for gestational age. And, uh, and then in the newborn, multiple complications, particularly newborn hypoglycemia. But in the long term, both in mother and baby, high risk of type 2 diabetes, and in the baby also risk of obesity, metabolic syndrome, and in the mother more recently we know now there's increased risk of cardiovascular disease. To summarize this, I just want to show you how in the postnatal period, in the adolescence, adulthood, how all, you know, gestational diabetes, um, you know, imparts all these metabolic complications, increasing their risk for intergenerational cardiovascular disease, so important to keep in mind. Recurrent GDM frequency, even in primary Paris women, um, you know, very high. As the number of pregnancies increase, the risk of recurrent gestational diabetes goes up. But for this meeting and for all of us, really significant is the amount of type 2 diabetes that happens in women with a history of GDM much higher. Now it is thought it is somewhere like 10 to 11 times higher risk of type 2 diabetes. Now going further, not only is it diabetes, not only heart disease, not only obesity, it's also now added on chronic obstruct, chronic lung disease. Whether it is pre-GDM or GDM, both of them increase the risk of lung disease as well. So pretty much all NCDs are covered. So Gestational diabetes is truly the mother of um, NCDs. 
Now, are there benefits to treating GDM? I think here is the only place unequivocally we can say yes. Yes, there are benefits to treating GDM. You have lower birth weight babies, and then the you know, mother benefits from detection of this uh, during pregnancy itself, and then of course uh, preventing complications in the, in the immediate postnatal period. Now comes the biggest problem that we have had over the years because there are multiples, um, multiple societies. Um, all of these have their own criteria for diagnosing GDM. And this may also be the reason why we are not able to come up with a quick solution because each society has its own way of dealing with this particular problem. So now you can see I've just uh, tabulated all of the societies. I have put an asterisk next to DIPSI, which is our national society and our national guidelines, and they do recommend testing at first contact. As soon as the woman comes in for at first booking, and they recommend testing with a 75 gram glucose, doing a two hour value, and if it's 140 or more, it's diagnosed as GDM. This used to be the criteria used by the WHO before 2013, when they then they adopted the IADPSG criteria, which was based upon the HAPO data, which I'll show you now. So HAPO was a big study. Um, involving multiple countries and thousands of patients. And what they showed clearly was there is no one number that we can say beyond which these problems happen, but it's actually a continuum. If you look at a, a normal healthy woman uh, who's pregnant and her sugars are all fairly low, so as they start rising, there is a continuum, and every point of the continuum, there is a co potential complication or there is a metabolic imprinting of starts. And to add to this, again, um, you know, this whole not being able to catch things, they're talking about should we have uniform thresholds? Should thresholds be different for different countries as well? So now, Coming to management of GDM, which I said, at least there we are somewhat on the same page, which is medical nutrition therapy, very, very, very important. Gestational weight management. This is again a place I don't think we spend enough time talking to our mothers about how much weight they should gain, how much should they gain each trimester, what should they eat, how active should they be, and what should be done if they are already starting overweight. But here again, the problem is we don't have specific guidelines for GDM women. It's for all pregnant women is the guideline that we have, though they are coming up with this. So medical nutrition therapy, gestational weight management, physical activity, self-monitoring of glucose, pharmacotherapy, and fetal and maternal health surveillance during pregnancy. So balancing the whole macronutrients, the carbohydrates, proteins, and fats is even, we have heard all morning about nutrition, even more important in this because we are dealing with two people. And we have to walk that fine line. The weight gain should be appropriate. The sugars have to be okay. The baby has to gain weight. And the mother shouldn't gain too much weight. And all of these things have to go on simultaneously. And, and that's very important uh, in GDM management. Typically, we prescribe uh, less carbohydrates in the morning and more in the afternoon and night. And, and that is a pattern that we tend to follow with our patients with GDM. And this is the IOM guidelines for gestational weight gain, the Institute uh, uh, of Medicine guidelines. And as you can see, they use a BMI cutoff. So as the BM, if the BMI is below 18.5, you can, you can allow them to gain more. And as the BMI goes higher, we need to allow them to gain less weight. On an average, a, a pregnant woman really needs to gain only around six to seven kilos. Um, and that includes the baby weight, the uterus weight, the water weight, and the, you know, the breast weight, and all of those things. It's only about that much. Everything else is actually ends up being fat and difficult for people to lose afterwards. And this is very important to keep in mind. What are the targets for glucose during pregnancy? Fasting below 95, and some would recommend 90. One hour definitely below 140, and two hour below 120. This is um, you know, very important, and the good thing is most societies are agreed upon this, and that's based upon CGMS studies in, in healthy pregnant women. And if you look at them, these numbers are even lower in normal women, in healthier women. So without hypos, if you can keep it tightly controlled, that's the best approach. Now, 
when do we use pharmacotherapy? Um, and as you can see here, if the fasting sugars are all more than 95, after two weeks of um, you know, medical nutrition therapy, and if the two-hour values are more than 120, and again, after two weeks of medical nutrition therapy, you should consider pharmacotherapy. This two weeks is not an absolute cutoff. If they're starting out with higher numbers, you can wait just one week and then go straight to pharmacotherapy. The three um, agents that we have now are insulin, metformin, and gliburide. Um, and in a short thing, I'll tell you which one. So insulin is safe, time-tested, multiple options. Most society, all societies agree upon it. The newer analogs like Detemer and Fiasp and all of them are good in, in pregnancy and approved. And dose adjustments possible to whatever the glucose level is. When it comes to metformin, effective in about 50% meaning, other 50% need additional insulin. There's less uh, there's weight gain. Um, it's preferred, obviously, by the, uh, by the mother. Comparable to insulin, but now more recently based upon the MIG tofu and the HAPO follow-up studies, there seems to be some offspring weight gain, and that has given some concern and reason for pause. And gliburide definitely has, is now going off the whole thing because though it's effective, there's more large for gestational age babies, more macrosomia, and more neonatal hypos. So if you had to choose, um, though most people easily use metformin, really we should use insulin. And in those who cannot or will not use insulin, go to metformin. And then, you know, try to stay away from gliburide. And I just want to show you that one of the two reasons why gliburide has fallen off the favor, you can see here uh, in terms of birth weight, comparison with insulin, and also neonatal hypoglycemia, you know, comparison with insulin, gliburide uh, did poorly. In addition to all this we do, it's very important to work, um, you know, with our OBGYN colleagues uh, and um, the maternal health, maternal health surveillance and fetal growth and fetal health surveillance simultaneously are so important, especially fetal growth patterns with, with, with ultrasounds that we have, very, very important. And when we decide to, uh, you know, usually moms with GDM can go on to full term, but uh, we use other criteria if they're on insulin, if they have comorbidities, previous pregnancy losses, or how they are doing in this pregnancy to decide if they should be delivered a week or two sooner. It's a completely obstetric decision, and, the, and GDM itself is not an indication for cesarean section. I want to spend a couple of minutes, the last couple of minutes, on the most important part and where I'm doing most of the work now is what to do with these women once they've had the baby. Out of sight, out of mind. The moment they've had the baby, everyone is happy. We are happy, OBGYNs are happy, mom is happy, family is happy, all happy, and they disappear. But really, these are the people, they need to be followed up because the next pregnancy is coming, and also a long-term trajectory, what needs to be done for them. So within six to 12 weeks, they must come back. We should discuss contraception. We should encourage breastfeeding, because breastfeeding has been shown to decrease the risk of type 2 diabetes in the mother, not only about weight, um, you know, weight maintenance or, or promotion of weight loss, but prevention of type 2 diabetes. So um, breastfeeding exclusive for six months and complementary longer, even one, one and a half years will be good. So they should do that. And then they sh we should ch check their glucose um, with a 75 gram GTT. Fasting sugar A1C GTT have been con uh, compared. GTT is the best to pick up pre-diabetes and pick up uh, diabetes. And then we find out whether they are still, they have diabetes or they are in the pre-diabetes state or if they are normal and based on that provide the interventions they need and the intensity of the follow-up they need. So these three steps we cannot forget. Just to help us and thanks to COVID, many innovations have come. And one of them is a self-administered OGTT test and they've compared it with the lab-administered OGTT. It's a kit that is mailed to the mother. She does the test at home postpartum, and the results are mailed back, and, and you can see the sensitivity and specificity are very high. Just want to point, point out that those options are also available. Now, 
Unfortunately, our professional societies in this also are not in agreement how often we should test, what criteria we should use, and, you know, those kind of things. So um, what we do in our practices, 6 to 12 weeks, I have the mother come in for a 75-gram GTT, use non-pregnant criteria to classify them, and then take them up, whether they are normal or pre-diabetes or diabetes, but keep a follow-up on them every three to six months and not Many societies say come back after one year or three years, and that's because the baseline diabetes risk in those populations may be much lower. Just to tell you, in the US, last week they published new data saying their risk of GDM has gone up 30% in the last two years. But they went from 6 to 7.5. We are somewhere at 15 already. So for us, it would be a you know, disaster if we went up 30%. So it's a disaster for the US also. But for us, it's um, as I men mentioned previously, we, we have a completely different set of problems in our country. So the benefits of postpartum follow-up are early detection of diabetes and pre-diabetes, lifestyle changes, recognition of CV risk factors, early intervention, planned pregnancy for the next one, prevention of future GDM and diabetes, and prevention of delaying complications of diabetes. Very, very important. Because the cardiometabolic implications of postpartum weight changes, even in the first year after delivery, has been shown to be very significant by Dr. Um, Ravi Ratnakaran. Um, one of the positive, very few positive studies have come out in this prevention of GDM, and one of them is, of course, um, lifestyle intervention, the, the Finnish JD, GDM um, gestational diabetes prevention study, or the radial study. They said a moderate individualized lifestyle intervention reduce the incidence of GDM by 39% in high-risk pregnant women. So at least that we can do because we have five to seven million women having GDM per year. So even if we can bring that down, I think that lowers the you know, future burden of diabetes. And prevention of type 2 diabetes, I showed prevention of GDM in previous GDM by lifestyle modification. So in this meta-analysis, they have shown that actually there's a 25% reduction in, in diabetes with intervention initiating earlier in the postpartum period. I know that recently a study, the Living Study, came out um, by Dr. Nikhil Tandon, which was a negative study. But then I also want to say the caveat is this is around the COVID time, so we really cannot you know, consider it on the same lines as this. So statistically significant greater reduction in mean, we mean weight as well. So I've come to my last two slides. What should a clinician do? Recognize the scope and significance of future risk of diabetes and, pro and promote universal testing. Testing at, as soon as the woman comes in, testing again at 24 to 28 weeks. If the initial test is negative, test her at six to 12 weeks postpartum. Keep reinforcing to mothers about their future risk for diabetes because the tone we set in the first meeting after diagnosis of GDM sets the tone for their life. Because you could say, don't worry, this is a pre um, diabetes that happens during pregnancy. For most patients, it'll go away, nothing to worry about. You could either say that, or you could say, you know, I'm glad we picked this up at this time, because this means we could prevent your uh, diabetes and prevent complications in your baby as well. So encourage breastfeeding, discuss planned pregnancy, preconception care. Keep reminding the patient to have regular follow-up after her GDM pregnancy. Keep an eye on the babies of mothers with GDM and partner with <coughs> pediatricians because mothers go for immunizations and other things. So the pediatrician could be our very good partner in this. So as Barker said, the womb may be more important than the home, and I think each year after he has said that, um, it is just becoming truer and truer. And preconception care. Address the girls and moms, um, the women in the reproductive age, before they get pregnant and straighten all this out, and we'll get much better results. Thank you so much.